Steve Arkhauser. Luke is our new candidate for a new pastor, so please join us for that. Um, they are amazing people, and it is going to be so amazing for you to see what the youth have been able to experience these past few months of them. So please join us for that. This coming up Sunday, October 3rd, we'll be voting on a new um, youth pastor, so please do not be late for that. Um, also, this coming up Wednesday, on October 6th, we'll be having a business meeting, so if you are coming to visit our service, please join us for that. And then on October 17th, just, um, a few Sundays after that, we'll be having our church picnic. It is going to be so much fun. We want to see you there. Um, everyone, the church will be providing the meat, so please just bring a side dish or a drink. Um, just bring your family, bring your friends. It is always a fun time, and we just cannot wait to see you there. I hope you have an amazing Sunday, and remember to be blessed.
give him a hand. Go and give him a hand. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad he's a good God? Aren't you glad he's great? It's a powerful name that we can always call on. God, thank you, Lord, as we sing these words, God, that they do resound to be true. God, that God, that you have been found to be this God who is a great God. God as we sing, all the earth will shout your praise. It's true. Every tongue will confess. Every knee will bow. God, I pray that we continue to believe, God, that you're great, that you're so good, that there's nobody like you. God, that we need you. God, not just when things look bad and stormy and the floods are coming. God, we need you right now just to breathe. God, it's your breath in our lungs. God, let us be more dependent on you, God, because we really do need you. And Lord, I pray that you just keep on moving, keep on working. God, I pray that you speak a powerful message through Keith, God, once again today. God, that you would move in such a way, God, that your spirit intervenes, God. God, that you convict us, Lord. God, that you that you will change us. God, that we're ready for it. God, let us have that expectancy to us. God, that we're not just sitting here, you know, staring at gaze. But God, we got our gaze fixed on you. God, and what you want to do. Pray this in your holy sweet name. In Jesus' name, amen. service that way. We never want to miss the fact of what God is doing. God is saving and people are being obedient by following, following Christ in baptism. And, and I am so thankful that the Lord has had his hand upon us and we see him continue to work. You know, Wednesday night we gather together as a church to pray. I've heard testimonies of, of different things that have gone on over the last few days, I just want to tell y'all that we serve a faithful God. We serve a faithful God that's listening to our prayers. Um, we have prayed many prayers for Adam, and we prayed prayers for the sick. We called out names throughout the church Wednesday night of people who sick. And we have seen God answer those prayers. And we see God moving in a mighty way. And I just want to say, church, that... I feel like there's no place that we could have been that was any better than right there at the feet of Jesus Wednesday night calling out to him. We all say that prayer's the work, and Wednesday night we did the work. We went to the one who, who is in control of all things. Now, over the last few weeks, we have been studying um, and looking at the Holy Spirit and talking about the Holy Spirit, and it started in the book of Acts. Uh, chapter 4, when they were praying and the place was shaken, and then they were filled with boldness and they went out. And the last few weeks we've been looking at what it means to be uh, filled with the Holy Spirit. And I want to I wanna just highlight a few things so that if there's someone here that wasn't here, that they're not missing anything as we move forward. So we all know that when we become a believer in Christ, when you've trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are given the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. That means that you have every bit of God that lives inside of you at that point. He is given to you. It's a gift that's, that's given. He comes and you become the temple of God and He lives inside of you. Now, even though we have the indwelling uh, presence of God in our lives, there is a difference from the indwelling and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is something that we do daily. It's something that we have to pursue and we have to yield ourselves to His will. It's no longer it's me, it's, it's God. It's not my will, but God's will. And as we surrender our will and we yield ourselves to Him and we come into His presence, it automatically draws us to a place that it brings confession and repentance. And when confession and repentance comes before God, what happens is He starts to show you things in your life to look more like Christ. And as we look more like Christ, He changes us and we are filled with the Spirit and then it just flows out of us. Now, I want to say, as I'm going here, 
that we talk about. It's not running into his presence with a quiet time and saying, okay, I'm going to read a couple scriptures, check, I've got this off my list, I'm going to do this, or I'm going to pray for a few minutes, check, and then I'm going to run. No, it's, it's going into God's presence. All of those things usher us. Music. Some people love to listen to music before doing a quiet time, and it helps them to guide them to the place to be able to dig into the Word of God. And so they'll use, their, they'll use music to, to draw them to that place. I'm talking about when you're in the presence of the Lord Almighty. It's you and Him. The Word is speaking to your heart. He's grabbing a hold of you and He's showing you the things that, that you need. And He fills you up. You know how? You know what happens when that when when you're in the presence of God like that? There is just an overflow that automatically comes out of you. I guarantee you, if I went around this room, you would say you've been in the presence of people before and you knew that they had been in the presence of God. You could just see it flow out of their life. Why? Because they've been in that presence. They've been in, they've been in that place where they have been alone with God. So as we're filled with the Holy Spirit, as a church body, it brings unity among the church body. Last week we talked about the unity that it brings. That, that when we are right with God, when we have come into the presence of God, that He has made us a, a family. And this family is built on unity. Now, here's what Satan wants to do. Satan wants to split you up. He wants to bring division. He wants to bring you, he wants to bring you to a place where the church is split. Because when the church is in unity, there's nothing that can come against the church that takes us down. When we are in unity, there is nothing that can take us down. We are strong together. We're strong together. We, we talked about, I, I loved it, that uh, Donovan was telling me about a quiet time that he had with his children. And, and he was explaining the redwood trees and how they grow together and they in, entwine together the root system to make them strong. And what an example. That's what happens to us as the body of Christ. As we come together, we are put together and we are made strong together. You wouldn't have a chain. Yesterday we were dragging some logs at my house and I didn't use a chain with just one link in it. It had many links that was hooked up together and it gave it strength to be able to pull those logs that needed to be pulled. By the way, I've got a bunch more. No, I'm just <laughs> uh, we, uh, we, we, uh, we, we were working on, on the house yesterday. But we need each other. We need each other to be together to give each other strength. And that comes with unity. Now, that don't mean that everyone's the same. I want you to understand that, that we're all made different. We're not, y'all would have a fit if there was a church full of keys sitting in this church. No, there's not that way. We have, we have, each one of you has your own mind and you think, and God created us to be able to make decisions. But there are some things that we do not compromise at all that brings unity in the body of Christ. And so that brings the oneness in the body as unity comes in. Now I want you to think about this. So you can be turning in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And here's where I want to start today. And I want us to start looking at spiritual gifts because there is another gift that God gives you and it's called a spiritual gift. A grace gift, if you would. And we're going to talk about what that means. But God has equipped us with a, with a spiritual gift to be able to use in the body of Christ. Now, I want you to think about this. We're unified together. As we're talking today as a, as a body, uh, if you're here today and you're not a part of, of Greenbrier Road Baptist Church, I, I'm, I'm explaining to, to our church today what I pray that we get across to the church today. As believers in Christ, God needs all of us to work together, and He has, he has made it. He has given us this gift that we can all work together and to be used together to build and to edify, to build the church, and to advance the kingdom of God. I want you to know today that God wants to use you in a special way. He has gifted 
Every believer that's sitting in here today, he has given you a gift. Everyone. If you have put your faith and trust in Jesus, you have a spiritual gift that God wants you to use in the body of Christ to edify the church, to build up each other, to make us that strong link to advance the kingdom of God as we move forward. So I want us to look at Ephesians chapter 12, I mean 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and I want to read the first four verses, and we're also going to be going to the book of Ephesians and looking at the book of Ephesians also. But right now we're going to just start in 1 Corinthians. Would you stand for the reading of God's word? Now concerning spiritual gifts, brother, I do not want you to be unaware. Some of your Bibles say ignorant there, probably. Um, mine says unaware. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to the mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is a curse. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. Let me pray. Our dear Father, I pray right now that you would bless the reading of your word. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, reveal the things that would make us look more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, he goes and he says, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews, Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. We're one in the body of Christ. Today we want to talk about the body of Christ. As I said, God wants us to be one, unified together. Satan wants to tear you apart. He does not want us to be one. Christ himself prayed that we would be one with him. And then Satan, he tries to divide us together and to take us apart. Today, I want you to see that Satan does not want us to be unified. Now, I want you to think about that. Keith, why do you keep saying that? Because everyone that we talk to, I've got three pastors in here now, and I, if I was to talk to the three pastors, I guarantee you that every one of us would love for our churches to look like the Book of Acts. We would love to have a church that was praying that was using all their spiritual gifts, that was unified together and going and sharing the word of God. And he was adding to the church and multiplying his church as we moved forward. The church was all together as one. They were filled with the spirit. Now let me ask you a question. What would it look like today, Greenbrier, if we were filled with the spirit of God? What would change? What would it look like if each one of us was using our spiritual gifts? What would the church look like? And what would happen, what would happen if we was going as a church to be a witness of our Lord Jesus and what he done? in our community as we are unified as one as we are using our spiritual gifts and now we're going what do you think the outcome would be? We see the example in the word of God in the book of Acts we see that they were adding to the church they were making difference in the daily lives everywhere they went they were making difference and there was power in the word of God that they were preaching. He wanted the church to be mature. He wants the church to be functioning. He wants the church to be growing. He wants the church to be a witness and manifesting God's love. How do we do that? Through him. Through the Holy Spirit. Through the filling of the Holy Spirit. And using the things that he has given us. He had a plan. 
He had a plan for us to be a witness for him. Every believer. I want you to, I, 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 today I want to take excuses. I, I shared with Dalton yesterday. Um, he was playing golf, and, and he, it's been several weeks since he's got to play. And uh, his life is changing now. And so when I was talking to my brother, when I was talking to my brother, he was making excuses because he ain't been out there for a while and he was getting beat. And I told him, I told my brother, I said, you tell Dalton to quit making excuses because all those excuses is going to do is make a loser. <laughs> well, do you know today that some of us are so down in the church and we're so feeling whooped and defeated because we make excuses, I can't do this. When God says, you can do this, I have given you the Holy Spirit. I have given you a spiritual gift that he has equipped you with. And that takes all excuses off the board. In a football game, the game is never won with the quarterback. It is won with all the players on the field. I've never seen a quarterback go out on the field and be able to take the ball and have the defense set up and be able to score a touchdown with nobody else out on that field. But as a church, as a church as a whole, we look at it that, hey, maybe a few of us can do what they're supposed to do, have enough pastors that can go out and share, and we can have enough leaders that will teach Sunday school, or we can have enough people that will volunteer to do this, and I can sit back and do nothing. And that causes for the body to be unhealthy. It is not the way that God designed the church. I want us to be able to see today that, that God's plan was for the body to function together. It is to come together and to be able to use everything that he has given us. When he fills us with the Holy Spirit, that brings unity. Why? Because we see in the things that he wants. He will reveal those things. Hey, guys, I ain't talking about a regular church in the United States. What I'm preaching today is God's design, our creator of this earth, the way he designed the church to be able to grow and to have power and to be able to change the world. Let me ask you this question. We've made this statement last week. Let me ask you this. What do you think the people of the world, not the church, the people, the lost people in the world would think if they seen this type of church, one that's unified, that's working together, that loves each other, that is built up with the, all their spiritual gifts being used, and then they take those spiritual gifts to advance the kingdom of God, what would happen in the world if they seen that? There would be power. There would be people turning to Jesus. There would be people that would be getting saved that we could disciple, that God brings in those gifts into the church to better to edify the church. So what is a spiritual gift? What is spiritual gift? Spiritual gift is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit enabling one to minister to the needs of Christ's body, the church. Let me say that again. Spiritual gift is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit enabling one to minister to the needs, the body of the church. He's given us spiritual gifts to build up the church, to build up the church inside the body of Christ. He has given us the, 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 the gifts of the, Holy, of the spiritual gifts. At the moment you gave your life to Christ, I know I've said this, at least two or three times. I want to show you now in Scripture. At the moment that you gave your life to Christ, when you surrendered your life and made Jesus Lord of your life, the moment that you was born again and your life was changed, He gave you a spiritual gift. And that spiritual gift is to build up the body of Christ that you are serving in and to be able to advance the kingdom of God. When we're using our spiritual gifts, it builds up our church. The Greek word used here stresses a grace gift. 
a grace gift. Now that kind of struck me when you see that because everywhere that it shows and it talks in Ephesians and in 1 Peter and, and again in, um, in Ephesians and 1 Peter and 1 Corinthians, all of them use these same terms. Listen it to Ephesians 4, 7. He says, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Ephesians 3, 7. This is what Paul said. Paul said, of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace which was given to me according to the working of his power. Whose power? His power. It's him that lives inside of us. Guys, <laughs> please, catch this. Catch it. Paul himself said it was the power of Christ that was working in him, that was working through him, it's the power that's working inside, inside. He knew it was a gift from God's grace. Listen to this, God's grace. What is grace? We all know, we would say that's an undeserving gift. It's something that we do not deserve. It is God's bestowed, he bestowed on us grace. He gave us grace. Here's the deal. We didn't deserve the spiritual gift. There was nothing that we did that deserved, that deserved that. Grace is a favor, a benefit. The spiritual gift is a benefit to us. It's manifested in the benefit through Christ to me and you. Did you hear that? It's manifested through Christ in me and you, to me and you. It's grace, grace gift. It was given to God to be able to accomplish what he wanted. Does that not make y'all excited? At least smile. At least give me a smile. I mean, I don't understand. I don't understand. I know I'm not the only one that this makes me excited. Because for years I lived a life feeling like that I stumbled around different things and I couldn't do things. Brother Michael tell you, I struggled with this for years. When I first came to Westwood, I struggled with being able to do different things, and I didn't understand exactly what God was doing in my life. So what I would do is I would sit in a pew, and I wouldn't do anything. And then God would start using me. I knew I could go out, and I could use my abilities, so I would use things like cutting grass, because I would do that on my own abilities, and the things that I have, and the skills that I had. So I thought that was using what I needed. So I'd go out there and I'd cut, and I would do things. Now that is the gift of health. You can, you can use that as a gift of health. But I'm just saying, that was how I looked at it. But today, I'm telling each one of you that God had grace, and he gave you a spiritual gift that he wants you to use in the kingdom of God, and he has put you to use that spiritual gift in a special way in this, in this church. Ephesians, and... and he says that he is given. It's given to you. It's by Christ. Nothing we do or nothing that we can that we had to do when we surrendered our life. He gave you that gift. It was given to you. It'd be like me going and getting whatever that I wanted to buy for Kim, and I give her that gift. That gift, Kim don't know what's inside that gift. When God, he equipped me and you because he knew what was best for you and what he wanted you to do in his kingdom. Do you realize our God, our creator, who created the trees that's perfect, that created the world that you see, and he gave us the air to breathe and, the, and all the things that we have, he knew exactly what you needed to do in his body, and he created and he gave you that gift to be used in the kingdom of God. Man, Mikey, he wanted you. Guys, when we see this and we realize what he has done for us, God gave spiritual gifts to the people of the church, not to the outside world. It was the people who was his believers, his children. When we were marked and sealed, he gave us that gift to the church to edify, to build up. Listen to what 1 Corinthians 12, 7. But to each one, listen to this, to each one, you, every one of you, 
have a spiritual gift, if you have surrendered your life to the Lord and made him Lord of your life, you have a spiritual gift that God wants to use in your life to build that youth up and to build the kingdom of God. Amen. He has given you that spiritual gift to be used. 1 Peter 4.10 says, it, As each one has received a special gift, employed in, in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Ephesians 4, 7 again. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measures of Christ's gift. He has given you a gift, and we didn't deserve it, but he wants to use you. Bill and Ray, he wants to use you. He has given you a gift from God that he wants to use in your life, and no one else in that youth group has that gift quite like you do. He has made you unique so that you can be used by God. Let's just call it the truth of what the truth is. The truth is he needs Blake to do what he has equipped Blake to do. In order for our, our body to operate the way that it needs to operate with these spiritual gifts, we have to be equipped that the body works together. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4 and 7, he tells us, he tells us that the, the church in Corinth, it had everything that it needed. It had been given. Listen to what he says. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God, which was given to you in Christ Jesus, that in everything you were enriched in him, in all speech and knowledge, even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you, so that you did not lack any gifts awaiting eagerly revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. You are not waiting. He has the gifts that's needed right here. Does that not make y'all excited? The only thing, let me just say this, the only thing that's holding us back from doing the will of God exactly what he has is us being disobedient and not using our gifts today. Did you hear what I say? It's not the money. It's not the building. It's not, it's not the, the facilities. The only thing that's holding us back today is our obedience to God. When we use those spiritual gifts that God's given, and everyone is using those, they bring us, they unite us together. And when they unite us together, we have power together. And it's power that will change this world. That's what he wants. <laughs> we have it. Kevin, I know when you go on the court, you like to win. He will do everything he can. He will use the weapons that he has on that court to win that game in every way he can. I am telling you today, as you walk in this church, when we come together, we are a body of Christ that has everything that we need to glorify and to build up each other in this church. It's not our abilities or talents. It's not our abilities or talents that I'm talking about. It's not the things, it's a special gift given from God that has power when you use it. Let me give you an example. Because sometimes we look at spiritual gifts and they say, well, he's got that spiritual gift, so I won't do that. Let's just take the gift of giving. I've got a very good friend, me and Kim does. He taught my boys, and, and I owe him. He took my boys when they were in, in the fifth, sixth grade, and he taught them, and he, he just invested in them. And I owe that man a lot for investing into my two boys. But that's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about his gift. See, this man, you didn't have to tell him. If there was someone with a need, you know what he would do? He would just automatically meet that need. I, I invited him one time to a, to a conference that I had that had a guy that was feeding kids in, in Kenya. And we were going to try it in Tanzania, but it never really happened in Tanzania. But when he met this person, and they told about the kids needing food to eat, you know what he did? I want to give to that. Next year I get a call from him, hey, I can do more than that. I want to give more. The next year I want to do more. And still to the day, he's still doing the same things over and over and over. He's using his spiritual gifts. He has a spiritual gift of giving. But let me tell you this, each one of us
have been called to give and to tithe. You may not have that spiritual gift, but you are called through the Bible, through the Word of God, you have that, that, that command to give and to, to give back to God, to tithe and to give of what we have, to be good stewards of what God has for me and you. You see what I'm talking about? Let me use one for me. I used to struggle, struggle real bad. When I was at Westwood, I, I, I really struggled until I started learning what my spiritual gifts was. I would go out and I would, I would get so scared when I would go share the gospel. I'm telling y'all, I was the one. I tell the outreach every time, every time we go through a cycle. But I remember going to Miss Jean's house, Brother Mike, I was on his team. I remember going to her house and he asked me to share about the picture. We was doing faith and they had a picture of Jesus on the cross there. And he asked me to share that, that pic, about that picture. And when I started to share, I asked Miss Jean, I said, Miss Jean, what do you see in this picture? And my hands were shaking so bad. I was so fearful of what, what I was going to say and if I was going to say something wrong or lead them the wrong way. She said, Keith, if I can see the picture, you're shaking so bad I can't see the picture. She said, can you hand me this? Brother Michael, I'm not telling the truth. I had to hand that to Miss Jean and I stumbled all the way through sharing the gospel with her. But you know what I found out? When I found out that God had given me a gift of evangelism and when I found out that he had empowered me and it was no longer me going out and doing it, but it was God doing it, he then took me and he put me going out in my community. But not only my community, he put me going out to places across the United States to be able to share with people. And now I go to Tanzania, which I never thought I could do, in a place that I never thought I would go to, that I wasn't raised to go to. I went because God had called me and given me and gave me a way to come here and get Jesus Jesus. That is what a spiritual gift does for you. It wasn't about what I do, but wait a minute, let's hold on just a second. Everyone is commanded to be a witness. Amen. Acts one eight says, "You will be my witness in Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea, to the ends of the earth." You to be a witness for Him. But when that spiritual gift comes, He gives you power to be able to use that. Each believer is unique. It's kind of like let me let me just put it this way: If we want to take Mikey used to work for the police force. If we took fingerprints and we put the fingerprints in, Mikey, would we find one fingerprint that's the same? They're all unique, don't they? And it identifies who you are. I want you to think about this. When God gives you your spiritual gift, it may say evangelism, but I guarantee you he's equipped you in a different way than what he's equipped me in evangelism. Because the body of Christ needs people uh, the, uh, that's different from each other to be able to reach different people. And you can have those gifts, but it's used in a different way. So I want you to think about this. Every, every Christian has a life living in him, God himself, and a spiritual gift that is inside of you to, to use. I want you to think about that. <laughs> You have that. That is a healthy body. When everything in your body is working the way that it's supposed to, that is a healthy body. Total body is healthy. In other words, if God designed us to be a healthy body, we're to be growing and maturing, functioning, witnessing, and every member of the ministry leans on each other. Glory, I need you. Our body, as Greenbrier Road Baptist Church, needs you. You was called here with a purpose, and we're to lean on you. We're to lean on each other. Diane, we need to lean on you. You were sent from North Carolina to come here. We need you. God had a purpose and a plan. We're to lean on each other, to build up each other. You was given that gift. But here's what happens when, when we get out of the will of God. And we don't serve that way. We become and, and we're, uh, we fail to serve each other. Here's what happens. There comes unfaithfulness. You become carnal. Self-centered. Divisive spirits. Always looking for something. Your laziness. Spiritual. Non-functioning. 
The body is doing without you. It'd be like me hurting my arm and can't use my arm now. And I don't have the ability to use the arm because it has got to a place of unfaithfulness. There's no longer can depend on it. And what happens? The whole body suffers because one part is hurt. Think about that. Your body, as a body of Christ, if everything is not working the way that it's supposed to, then it don't function the way. It stunts the growth. And here's what happens. It cripples us. Oh, listen. Is this not the problem of the church today? Think about that. We want to know what's the problem of the church today. The problem is, is we've got crippled up because we're not using the things that Christ has given us. Now, Keith, why did you say all that? You had not used your scripture yet. Here's what I want to tell you. In the very beginning, it tells you not to be unaware. And I wanted to make you aware today. Because here's what happens when we talk about being unaware. There's a lot of people that sit in here, and, and when it comes to spiritual gifts, if we were being honest, we would run to a different denomination, and we would start thinking about that denomination when the Word of God says that each one of us has a spiritual gift. And then the second thing that would come to our minds is... Either healing or either tongues or the interpretation of tongues. They would automatically run to our minds. So we don't talk a whole lot about spiritual gifts because people think what's going to happen when you talk about these things. That is the very thing that happened to the church in Corinth. The church in Corinth, where we're reading right now, here's what's happened. They are so unaware of the spiritual gifts because they were of a pagan belief. They were of a pagan belief, and this pagan belief is one that believed in idol worship. They wasn't, they wasn't like the Jews that had the, the writings of the Old Testament. These were people who had been brought up serving other gods. And now, all of a sudden, they have been brought to this place that they're seeing, and Paul is telling them, don't be unaware of the problems that's going on. In verse 2, he comes, he comes back and he gives them the dangers of the past, the past influences that they followed. Listen to what he says. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols however you were led. It was pagan worship. It means idol worship. Idol worship. Evil. Demons. Let me just tell you about this. I see this all the time and it scares me to death. In Tanzania where I go... They can worship things like a stone. They may worship a dancing stone. We adopted an area that was 25 miles in diameter called Yupar Island, and what they worshiped was a dancing stone. This stone never talked to them. It never said anything to them. They had all these beliefs in this stone that they'd never seen work. But because witch doctors would do things that would cause them to slip away from it, they would go out there and they would slap this stone. Anna knows exactly what I'm talking about. She was with me there, so she knows exactly what would happen. They would go out and they would slap this big rock and start screaming to it. And what they say would happen is the rock would start dancing. And when it would dance, they would make their request. They'd take a little money and they'd throw it up under the rock, and they would ask for the request of that rock. They would bring sick people to this rock for healing. See, people worship things like that. Today, I can take you to a village right now that worships the spirits that are, are, are Muslim of uh, Muslim beliefs. And here's what they would do. They would go out twice a year. They would kill an animal. They would take the blood of that animal. And they would take out there in the middle of their yard. And they would put it on this little grave that they have. And then they would start dancing. The women would get naked. The men would run around and they start talking and all this gibberish talk and making all these noise. And they believe they're worshiping a God. The same thing the pagans were doing. They didn't realize. They hadn't been taught any different. That's what they believed in. That was their beliefs that they were following. Not just exactly like that now. I'm telling you what they did do in Africa. But they were believing these things. They were pagan beliefs. And here's what was happening. They were going. And what was happening is they would go back to their path. They would be believing some of what had happened in their salvation. And then they would put a little bit of their own beliefs of what they had been raised in their pagan belief. 
And they were doing these things. And Paul was telling them, don't be unaware. He is warning them of what's happening. Don't we do that today? I want you to just stop and think because this sounds way out there like we would never do this. But they were mixing their beliefs with idol worship. You know what idol worship can be? It can be that TV. It can be anything that you put before God is an idol. We have all kinds of things in the world today that we will mix with our, our, our what we believe. And then here's what happens. We will twist it just a little bit. Jeff told us uh, last week about taking the Word of God and just twisting it just a little bit to make people believe what you think is true. And they'll take it and they'll do it in the name of Jesus and tell you that it's right and when it's wrong. And he's warning them. He's telling them not to do this. So he ends by telling them in verse 3 to test the spirits. He says, therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. I want you to listen to what Exodus 20, 27, I mean 20 verse 7 says. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not leave him unpunished. Who takes his name in vain? How many times have you heard people use the name of Jesus and use it in vain? They use, they twist, they turn, they try to do these things. Let me just say this. I know when we're talking about spirits, sometimes we don't like to talk about these things. Here's what was happening. These people was using tongues. They were, they, they, were, they were interpreting things and saying these things are happening. They were prophesying, trying to say. They were using supernatural gifts that were supposed to be given by the Holy Spirit and they were using them the wrong way. They wasn't using them for the right reasons. They were using, they were putting the world and the idols and stuff and he, he, he does not, that you cannot do that. See, what happens is a, a Satan comes in and he attacks that. Why? Because you're out of the will of God. You're not doing God's will. You're following the will of man. And what happens, Satan comes in and he starts attacking in that place. And he brings division and it brings confusion. Here's what he says. He says, test the spirits. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, he tells us already in this scripture. I want you to see in verse 3. Here's what he says. He, he tells us, Jesus is a curse, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. If a person cannot claim Jesus is Lord, if he has somebody else that he is using as their God, he is wrong. It is a false God. It's not of our Father. Listen to what he says here in 1 John 4, 1 through 3. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. But test the spirit to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Do you know we've got them today? There's many false prophets that's out in the world today. And he says for our spirit to test that spirit. Here's what he says. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confessed that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that is coming. And now it is already in the world. It's people that's trying to trip us up and to do things. He says your spirit can test the spirits and you know. You know. I want to give you two examples right here that's pretty clear. Even Jesus himself had it happen to him. In Luke chapter 4, verses 33, do you remember in the synagogues when there was a man possessed by the evil spirits, an unclean demon? Here's what happened. And he cried out with a loud voice in verse 34. He said, let us alone. What business do we have with each other? With each other, Jesus of Nazareth. 
Have you come to destroy us? This is an evil spirit now. He's recognized Jesus. He knows Jesus and who he is. In Luke chapter 4, verse, 30, 20, uh, verse 35, he says, But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in the midst of the people, he came out, he came out of him without doing any harm, or without doing him any harm. And the amazement came up to all that began talking. And what they did is they just started spreading what Jesus had done. Jesus is all powerful. We have him living inside of me and you. He is in control of what we do. One last, remember in Acts chapter 4, I love reading these stories. I don't know about y'all. But in Acts chapter 16, I'm sorry, not 4, but 16, and verse 16 through 18, here's what happened. You remember the slave girl that was the fortune teller? And she was going about and she was following, following after Peter. And she kept crying out. And here's what happened. In verse 17 it says, following after, after Paul and said, and calling us. And she kept crying out saying, these men are bond servants of the most high God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. She continued doing this many days. But Paul was greatly annoyed and turned us and said to, to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very moment. Guys, let me just say this. Our Lord and Savior is in control of all things. He has gifted me and you with a spirit, a spiritual gift to use in the kingdom of God. Here's what happened. These people had every spiritual gift that was needed in the church, but they were misusing those gifts. Today, as we get ready to, to end, as we look at tw chapter 12, 13, and 14, I want you to know that all of these are going to be speaking on these spiritual gifts and the instructions to the church. But I want you to listen in chapter 14, verse 38, what he says. But if anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. But if anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. Here's what it means. If you reject, if you're unaware, you're going to stay unaware. If you don't recognize it, you're not going to recognize it. Let me ask you today, what would happen as we start studying these gifts? If you let the Holy Spirit speak to you and He showed you your gift, and as the body of Christ, we started working together. Let me tell you what happens in those, those villages. So I want to talk to you for just a minute about Eupara as we end. Eupara had all these people, 50,000 people that lived on this little island that we were, we were witnessing to. No church, no church at all. They were worshiping this rock, and they would worship animals and different things, but mainly the rock. And as we went, we shared the gospel there, and we started planting churches. Here's what happened. I noticed when we started to go baptize there in Eucara, we went down to the Lake Victoria, and there's a beautiful place that comes off the hill, and you go down to the lake, and when you get down to the lake, you can see the rock sitting up on the hill. We had, I don't know how many people, 20, 30 people probably. We was getting ready to baptize, and I'll never forget, as I was in the water and I was looking back, I was looking right at the rock, there would be people slapping. Want that rock to do something. We were out there baptizing people who had surrendered their life to Jesus. Now it scared us. I have to tell you, we had um, Westwood and we had uh, First Eulis that was partnered together and carrying the gospel there. And one of our biggest fears that would happen is, will they go back to these things as 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 we move forward? And as we reach forward, are they going to go back to their beliefs, their pagan beliefs? Here's what would happen. People would get saved. 
churches started being planted. People started moving to that island to preach in those churches. Today, in that little 25 mile area that's there, there's over 15 churches that are going out and sharing the good news of Jesus on that island. Let me tell you, let me tell you, let me tell you what happened. So the rock that they slap now is used for tourists to come and to come out there and to look and to, to walk around and to take little shows of them trying to make this rock dance. So they dress up in these little shorts and, and these little outfits and they go out there and they slap the rock, scream at the rock, do all things with the rock, and nothing happens. But my God, my God, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he stepped on that island, he changed lives. Today, they've already reached two more islands for the gospel of Jesus. Now they are going and they're multiplying. What happens when they find out that they have the Holy Spirit that lives inside of them? They're no longer worshiping a spirit that's never responded to them. They're worshiping the one true God who is alive and active and changing lives. Can you imagine what would happen to this church today if we were just surrendered? Let God use us the way that he is equipped for us to do this for him. Let's all stand. Our dear Father, I just come to you right now, Lord. And I thank you that you have equipped us to use us, to empower us to be able to, to build up the church. But not only to build up the church, but to be a witness in the world. Lord, I just pray that today... That, Father, that you would move. And, Lord, that if there's someone here that does not know you, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. Lord, if one does not have a church home, I pray that today that they would, they would make Greenbrier their, their place that they come and to worship to build the kingdom. Lord, whatever their decisions are, I pray that you would just move in a powerful way and that lives would be changed. In Jesus' name.
the nursery, so he asked me to come up, and then Pastor Keith says, you know, basically when God tells you to do something, you do it. So um, I just wanted to share with y'all that um, we, as the Youth Pastor Search Team, we are really excited to be presenting uh, Luke Burkhalter to the church uh, for election as our youth pastor. And I just wanted to remind y'all that this Wednesday, instead of Bible study, we will be all coming together, I guess the gym, um, bring food. We're going to have finger foods and just have a time of, of fellowship with Luke and Ashley. Give you the chance. We're calling them a meet and greet. I think everyone pretty much knows them. But give you the chance to ask any questions you'd like to ask them before we officially vote him in. And we will hold that vote next Sunday at the end of service, I believe. So please come, and please come Wednesday, and bring food, and we'll all just um, have a good time together. Thank you. The children will still practice here in the sanctuary. Okay. All right. Um, I want to bring Lori up. Uh, this is Lori, and today she comes forward, and uh, three weeks ago she gave her life to the Lord. And she gave her life to the Lord. I thank you, Lord, that, that you fill us and you give us that gift. And I ask, Lord, as we go today, that um, the people around would see that we have been in your presence. And I ask, Lord, that you, uh, you show each one of us what that gift is and how we can use it, Father. I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.